This is Coding Math, Episode 34, Line Intersections, Part 3. In the previous two videos, we created a function that can be used to determine when two lines intersect. We'll wrap up this series by looking at a couple of examples of how to use this function. One of the most obvious uses is in collision detection. In the previous episodes on collision detection, we saw that in order to detect collisions between two objects, you usually have to create some kind of mathematical model of those objects and then use some formula to determine if those two models are overlapping. The easiest models to detect collisions with are points, circles, and rectangles. Often, even if your object is not exactly one of those shapes, you can approximate it pretty well with one or more of them. But sometimes none of these will do. Take these two stars, for example. They're obviously not colliding. But if we were to represent them as rectangles, we'd get a false positive. Likewise, if we represented them as circles, they would report as colliding. Using line intersections is one way to start hit testing more complex shapes like these stars. You can see that each of these stars is composed of 10 line segments. If we test every one of those segments in the first star against all 10 segments in the second star, and any pair of them are intersecting, then the two stars are overlapping. If none of those lines intersect, then the stars could not possibly be touching. Let's see if we can code this up and see it in action. I'll start with the usual template, with the segment intersection function all set to go. I'll make an object star 0 to represent the first star. It will have an x and y for position and an array of 10 points. For now, I'll make these all 0. Then I'll give it another array of 10 points called offsets. Now, assuming that x, y is the center of the star, these offset points are the distance from that center to each point. We'll use those to calculate the actual on-screen positions of each point as the star moves around. I've already pre-calculated the offsets required to make a star, so I've just pasted them in here. In fact, let's take care of that updating right now. I'll create an update star function. That takes a star object as a parameter. It loops through the points array of that star and calculates each point's xy position by adding the corresponding offset to the current xy center position of the star. After updating, the points array can be used to draw the star. Let's make a draw star function. This begins a path, moves to the first point, loops through the rest of the points array, and then draws lines to each one, and then closes the path. We could do a stroke or fill here. I'll go with a fill. Now if we call update star and draw star, passing star 0 to each one, we can see that we've drawn a star. I'm so proud of us. Now let's make another one. I'll be lazy and just copy and paste star 0 and change the position. We'll update and draw star 1 now. And we have two stars. Now let's make it dynamic. I'll add an event listener for the mouse move event. In that, I'll set star 0's x and y to the current mouse position obtained through event client x and y. And I'll move both of the update and draw calls into this handler. And I'll clear the screen at the start of this function. Technically, we don't need to update star 1 each time since it's not changing its position, but you might want to add some code to make it move around too, so I'll just leave it there. Now as we move the mouse around, we're moving star 0. Okay, that was a lot of setup, but now we have two dynamic objects composed of points and lines that we can readily use to do some line intersection testing with. This isn't necessarily the best way to set up something like this, but hopefully it's fairly clear what's going on. I'll create another function called check star collision. This will take two stars as parameters. In here, we're going to do a double for loop. The first loop will loop through from zero to the length of the first star's point array. And it will get two points from that array. The first will be points i, and the second will be points i plus one. These pairs of points will define each line in the star. Now, in the last iteration, points i will point to the last elements in the point array, and points i plus 1 will point to one element beyond that. That's not good. What we want to do is get the pair of points that represent the last line, which is the last point, and back to the very first point. A trick for this is to use the modulus operator with the points array length, like this. 
Now when we hit the end of the array, i plus 1 mod points length will equal 0. That's the index of the first point, which is just what we want. Now we have pairs of points for the lines in the first star. We need to do another for loop within that to compare each line of that star with each line of the other star. Same basic code using a different index to get two more points. So now we have four points, p0, p1, p2, and p3. We can plug those into our segment intersect function and see if the lines they represent are crossing. If so, we know the stars are hitting, and we can just jump out of these for loops by returning true. If it's false, however, we need to continue looping till we get to the end. If we reach the end of both of these loops, that means we haven't found any intersections, so we can return false. Now let's use this function. Right after the calls to update, but before the calls to draw, I'll say if check star collision star 0 star 1. If that's true, then the stars have hit. To indicate that, I'll set the context fill style to red. If there is no collision, I'll set it to black. The idea is that when the stars hit, they'll turn red. Let's test it. Right on. Now, of course, code like this can get pretty intensive pretty quickly. If you have two very complex objects, or more than a few complex objects that you're testing between, you can easily get into hundreds or even thousands of calls to that line intersection method. So first of all, you probably want to go in and optimize the heck out of everything here. Don't assume that any code I give you is fully optimized for speed and efficiency. It's not. It's optimized for clarity and understandability. Optimization is your job. You also want to try and limit how much testing is being done and how complex your objects are. And mix and match your collision methods using circle, rectangle, and point collision detection where possible, and line intersections only where needed. Okay, enough preaching. Let's look at one more, less obvious example. Say we're shooting some kind of particle across the screen here, and we want to know when it hits this wall here. This wall is composed only of a line, and the particle is a point. So at first glance, what we need is a point-line collision, and we haven't covered anything like that. And in reality, it's very rare that the point will ever actually hit that line. On one frame, it will be on this side of the line, and on the next frame, it will be over here on the other side, jumping right through the line without ever touching it. But this picture should give you a hint to the solution. We have two points here, before and after. Connect them with a line, and we have the trajectory of that particle for this current frame. So if this line hits this line, not only do we know that the particle has hit the line, but we know the exact point where it did so. That's where we create the explosion, or whatever. So I've set up another file here and filled in most of the code already. We create a simple particle with an x, y, vx, and vy for velocity, and an array of lines. Each line is composed of two random points. An update method is called with a request animation frame at the end. In that, we clear the screen, call the draw lines function, which draws all those lines, update the particle's position, and draw the particle. So if we test that, we can see that the particle flies off the screen, most of the time passing through one or more lines. I'll run this a few times so you can see it. Now we want to know if or when this particle does cross any of those lines. And if so, where exactly? So before we update the particle, we'll create a point, P0, which represents the particle's current position. And after the update, we'll create P1, which is its new position. Those two points form the first line, which is the particle's trajectory on this current frame. Now we can loop through each of the lines in the line array, which gives us two more points for each line. And now we can call the segment intersection function to see if we have a hit. We'll store the result in an object called intersect. Remember, this will be null if there's no intersection, or a point object if there is. So if we've hit a line, we'll draw a red circle right at the point of the intersection. Then we'll just return out of the function, which will bypass the request animation frame and end the animation. If we don't get a hit on any of the lines, we just continue looping. So we run that a few times, and when it hits a line, we get a red circle right there. 
Note that the particle itself might be off the line a bit because we already drew it before determining where the intersection was. But that red circle will be exactly centered on the intersection of the particle's path and the line that it crossed. So those are a couple of examples of real-world line intersection functions in use. I've actually used both of these techniques in a game I created for Windows 8 called Infiltration. Here you can see it in action. The ship is composed of four points that are used to create four lines. These are tested against all the lines making up the walls of the various structures. Also, all the bullets being fired are using the technique just discussed to determine when they've hit any walls. And yes, I did a lot of optimization and profiling to make sure this ran as smoothly as possible, even with very complex levels. So there you go. I hope this gives you some ideas on how to use this technique.